Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for John to slot me into a, a topic of carotenoids as, as zinc. And uh, I hope I can convince you uh, that it is important. It's not only the carotenoids, but zinc is also important. In fact, they probably are important together and with many other factors. So thank you very much, John, to giving me one and a half hours uh, to talk. But Tunde has already taken the first half an hour and introduced um, the topic, which is, which is very important to understand from the clinical perspective. I'm a biochemist, so I'm glad I don't really need to talk about the, the actual clinical uh, uh, side of work, although I started to tap into it. Now, when I need to talk about zinc, I think uh, I want to highlight for everyone that actually every, pa every, bit, oops, every bit of the central nervous system when you look for zinc, especially bioavailable zinc, and I will tell you what that means, then you will find that from the eye to the visual cortex, there is a lot of these. So I threw up a, a, a terminology, bioavailable zinc. During the talk, I will refer to this. This bioavailable means which is biologically active, because the body has a lot of zinc, and again, I will uh, touch on those, what that means, but only a very small percentage that actually have a biologically relevant, uh, now all of them is biologically relevant, but there is a very small percentage that is changing in a way that is able to modify uh, biological processes. And the way how we start to uh, try to study this is trying to visualize where it is. That's the first step we want to do. And we have methodologies, uh, different biosensors that can detect zinc. Uh, some of them work better than others. And there is this method called automatography, which is a, a zinc enhancement, just like a photograph, which is probably so far the best to, to detect this bioavailable zinc. And I show this picture of, uh, of the brain where the visual cortex shows that there is a lot of uh, biologically available zinc there. That's the end. But when you go to, to the actual retina and use the same te technique, and there you need to and can use electron microscopy, these little black dots represent uh, this bioavailable zinc. They are in the melanin pigments. They are in the photoreceptors, especially in the discs. And very few uh, appreciation is given to the fact that the, 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 the pigment incorporates into the discs in the presence of zinc. Zinc is essential to stabilize uh, uh, the photopigment uh, in the disc. And then you see a lot of zinc in the pigment epithelium and even in the Brooks membrane. So there is zinc everywhere. And if you look at the whole retina, and I will talk about that uh, a lot, then you will see that every retinal layer contains it. Why did I start to study zinc? Uh, this is very simple, because there was the ARET study, which showed that there is some benefit when you uh, supplement the diet with zinc. But when I started to ask the ARET uh, study uh, people of, of why do you put zinc in there, there wasn't really a very strong case scientifically. Why would you do that? And we still don't have a very clear idea what zinc is doing. So my interest stems from my uh, previous uh, life, where I worked uh, on Alzheimer's disease and looking at plug deposition and the role of zinc there. So my first question was, is there zinc in the deposits, which, uh, which we call drusen in the, in the eye, but maybe it's similar to the plugs in the brain. So what we started to do, we looked with these uh, zinc selective sensors. We looked at the distribution of zinc in the back of the eye. This is a human eye, the optic nerve. This is the macula with uh, large drusen in them. And as Tunda pointed out, there is plenty of deposition in the peripheral retina, and that's what you see lighting up like little eye bulbs, uh, light bulbs. This is the Brooks membrane choroid complex. Okay, so we don't have the, uh, the retinal pigment epithelium or the neurosensory retina. So what it means that the actual drusen contains very high concentration of zinc. 
So for me, it's a very important thing to understand why zinc would accumulate, what its role in this whole place. And if there is so much zinc that can uh, accumulate to hundreds of parts per million in these deposits, where is it coming from? And how would that uh, contribute to the deposit formation? Again, just a snippet from my previous life, amyloid plaques contain a huge amount of zinc and amyloid beta binds zinc and when you bind, uh, when zinc binds to amyloid uh, beta, then it changes its conformation and that's uh, thought to be important how plaques form. So the big question, if there is so much accumulating in the drusen, which is a very early uh, sign and in fact the ha hallmark of diseases like uh, age-related macular degeneration, and as you heard, we find that in Alzheimer's disease, then where is this zinc coming from? This is uh, a picture which we drew for a, for a review uh, a couple of years ago where we summarized how much total zinc is across the retina and how much of this bioavailable zinc. Take this picture with a pinch of salt. This is the review of the literature at that current point. I think the picture will change now that we have better methodologies to detect uh, an element like zinc, and you will hear in a few minutes why this is an important statement. But what's very important, that the RP choroid complex is actually chock-a-block of zinc. And the reason, at least one of the reasons, is that amongst the five uh, enzymes that are involved in melanin synthesis, four of them are entirely zinc dependent. So this cell, these pigmented cells, need bucket loads of zinc. So there is a, a good sense why you would want to, to maintain a good zinc balance in the back of the eye. As I mentioned, zinc was uh, suggested to be useful for AMD and uh, of course when you go into the literature, as with everything else, uh, the more you read, the more confused you become. Some studies show positive effects, other studies actually show negative effects, and as it, as it has to be, there are papers in between where they show no effect. What the reason for that, we, we, we don't want to uh, elaborate on, but, but, but there is a confusion still. What's also less appreciated, also it's becoming much, much, much more uh, prevalent uh, in, in the thinking process, is that only 20 to 30 percent of the zinc which we take into the body uh, will be actually bio biologically available to do something. Because we eat lots of phytates, and that's one of the, the buzzwords these days uh, for healthy lifestyle, you need to eat lots of uh, fibers and phytates. And then, of course, these are excellent metal chelators, not just zinc, but it can cause all sorts of other uh, iron deficiencies. It's also important to, to uh, notice that the way we implement or, or apply zinc is important. Many studies use zinc oxide, which is, which is fantastically insoluble. Uh, so maybe adding 80 to 200 to 300 milligram doesn't actually uh, translate into, into real uh, zinc availability. So it's an issue which we need to, to consider. But to me as a bi basic scientist, the most important issue was when I started out about 12 years ago on this, on this journey, is that there is very little solid scientific evidence what zinc is capable of doing and what it would mean if we grow, uh, or if, if, if we don't have enough zinc. So I want to talk just a little bit uh, in the remaining 50 minutes about what zinc is and what it can do. So zinc is very tricky to study. It doesn't have a color, no spectroscopic signature which we could look at. Hard to detect in individual proteins because it's very dilute. And even today, there are no reliable and specific tests that we could use to detect zinc. We often rely on uh, measuring zinc in, uh, in serum, which is probably the most unreliable way to detect uh, zinc status. Zinc binds to different proteins and play a very important role in catalytic structure and regulatory function. So it's, it's very wide-ranging what it does. 
What is really a trouble for us is that there are potentially almost 3,500 proteins that bind zinc in the human genome. So it's a huge number. But you know, if, if you think about 10% of your total, uh, or over 10% of your total uh, uh, proteins are zinc binding, zinc dependent, we should really think about uh, trying to work out the way how, does, how zinc works. So of course what happens, zinc binds to protein, and, uh, and then these complex will form a function, which of course lyrase is acid, and we don't really understand how these, uh, these processes uh, affect the, the homeostasis. But one thing which I'd like definitely to make as a take-home message, that the total cellular zinc is over 250 micromole. It's very high. But the actual uh, cellular freezing content is many orders of magnitude lower. So this is when I originally referred to this bioavailable zinc, which is able to do some kind of sort of, let's put it in a probably wrong way, signaling function in a cell is very low, despite the very high concentration that is needed for the cell to work. But we often compare uh, uh, the effect of zinc to calcium, as uh, one of my colleagues said that zinc is the uh, calcium of the 21st century. Uh, it is not. Uh, it's much more interesting, of course, than calcium. Um, <laughs> zinc has an inward gradient, so there is much more zinc inside the cell than outside. Calci oops. Calcium, there is more in the extracellular space and less inside. So, the coordination chemistry is different. Uh, it, it is different how it binds to molecules. Uh, the mechanism of its release is, uh, is, is a chemical as, of, as opposed to conformational. So calcium is released when it's changing uh, or, or binds and changing the conformation. And the effect uh, of zinc, as far as we know now, is much longer duration than, than the calcium transients which we see in cells. And the concentration change is much more mild. And interestingly, zinc is mainly doing some kind of inhibitory action as opposed to activation like calcium. But I think it's important to keep in mind that it's very different. It's, it's, it's very similar in terms of size and molecular composition and electron structure and everything but do very different things. One of the important messages, again, a, a take message, wherever calcium binds, zinc will bind better because it's smaller, it has different coordination chemistry. So it is actually capable of replacing calcium very easily, and it's not true vice versa. I mentioned that they, there is a problem that there is very little of this biology active metal and if you, if you see copper and zinc has the lowest concentration of all the, the metals in the body. The complication increases when you look at that there are currently 24 specific transporters for zinc. So it's very difficult to study how zinc is moving around. Iron I think has three. As I mentioned, coordination chemistry, the ligands where zinc binds is complicated, depending on which amino acids are involved, uh, the, the binding partners are, are quite worried, varied. It's quite varied where they bind. So within cysteine, even within a cysteine molecule, there are different uh, coordination chemistry. So it's, it's, it's increasing gradually the complexity. And then when you go to real life enzymes, then depending on what combination they, they, they coordinate in the molecules, it increases the complexity further. And then of course, just to, to make you even more bored with zinc, there are many binding sites and depending on how they uh, bind to different parts of molecules, then the quaternary structure of a protein can, can increase. This is when you have two zinc ion binds to it, and then you can have three. And this combination will be very important for the, for the structural build up of proteins and protein complexes. And of course, the function of these proteins will be affected by this. Here is an example on of the NF copper B pathways. When you look at just five elements of that pathway, 
you need 33 zinc ions for that pathway to work properly. So why I said that is because I want to emphasize that zinc is very important and many proteins are uh, requiring zinc. And therefore, in places like the eye, zinc is likely to play a very important role. But just to make life really difficult, when you look at a titration curve, this is just measuring zinc directly in water, for example. If you look at a biological fluid, then you will find there is a huge amount of molecule that can buffer zinc. And therefore, adding more and more zinc, uh, sorry, adding a certain amount of zinc will have a different effect depending on what biological fluid you are uh, using that in. And I will show an example in a minute. What does that mean? So what we are interested in, why there is this huge amount of zinc accumulation in the extracellular space between the pigment epithelial cells and the choroidal vasculature. For that, we need to study that interface. So here is an RPE cell. Here is the choroidal vasculature. And what we think is there is a continuous movement of zinc between the bloodstream and the RPE and back. And this is the Brooks membrane where Drusen develops. That will be a buffer zone. There must be some kind of zinc homeostasis which we want to maintain. And that zinc homeostasis will affect, at least that's our hypothesis, both the endothelium and the epithelial cells. If you have a thickening of Brooks membrane and binding of the zinc in the, in the Druze, then this uh, homeostasis in, in here and the availability of zinc for the pigment epithelium and the choroid could be affected. And that was the first step which we wanted to study. What is the effect of zinc on this complex? And as you do, as a biochemist, you start looking at uh, the individual components and as much as possible in isolation. But first, is there really zinc in the Brooks membrane? And when we look at a four months old or a 12 months old animal, then you see the thickening of Brooks membrane, which is uh, a, a well-documented uh, change with aging. And when you look at zinc, you can see that there is many more zinc accumulation in this space. So yes, zinc is present in a bioavailable form in the Brooks membrane, and it seems to accumulate in an animal model. So what is the consequence of that? And I'm not going to show you very detailed studies, rather just snapshots of what we already discovered. For example, when we looked at complement fact, uh, co the complement system, one of the, 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 uh, the, the molecular cascade that is very heavily in, uh, in impl implicated in uh, age-related macular degeneration, then we find that both C3B factor H or their complex bind zinc. The consequence of that, that it brings this out of solution. So basically, it crashes the, um, uh, the, the, the innate immune system. So if you have too much zinc and the body try to interfere with the inflammation, the slow-grade inflammation that is going on in the back of the eye, then we actually cause problem with that uh, increased level of zinc. And that's exactly what you see. This is a Druze, and this is a complement factor H. And as you can see, in complement factor H is very heavily deposited into this, into this uh, Drusen uh, in, a, in a very interesting uh, uh, circular shape. I won't have talk, uh, time to talk about it, but now we know why they form this unusual structure. But, but what it means that if you have too much zinc and there is an inflammation and factor H is coming probably from the, uh, uh, the circulation, then when the two meets, instead of repairing any inflammation or controlling inflammation, it comes out of solution and lets the inflammation going on. What happens to the RPE cells? Is it important how much zinc there is for the RPE cells? Now, I'd like to show you something which is, I think, very important for those who work with cells. This is a graph where we added different concentration of zinc to a culture medium that is very uh, healthy for RPE cells. And when we add up to 125 or 150 microliter zinc to, this, uh, to the medium, 
when we, when we measure the available zinc, we are down to few nanomole. So three, four order of magnitude change in, in zinc concentration. So it's very important when you design a study to, to contemplate that there is a lot of zinc buffering in your system and you need to check how much zinc is there. But when we do this, so these are different concentrations of added zinc. This is transepithelial resistance of the, the retinal pigment epithelium. And please don't tell these results to anyone because none of these are published yet. Uh, so this is just between you and me. So this is the control where, where the, the transepithelial resistance as it's supposed to be increasing up to 30 days in medium. But if we add zinc, then we can increase the transepithelial resistance dramatically. We can increase the pigmentation of a cell. Pigment epithelium, obviously, the more pigmented, the more dif uh, differenti differentiated they are. And there is a dramatic change in, uh, in pigmentation. There is a clear change in gene expression of genes that are important for proper differentiation. And when you look at the secretome from these cells, because RP cells will, as you know, the function is to engulf the broken off photoreceptor outer segment, chew them up, reuse what they can, and spit out what they don't want to the blood circulation. So there is a lot of uh, uh, secretion. And as you can see, zinc, affects several of the proteins, but I highlighted complement factor H and HTRA1, two molecules that are heavily implicated in AMD. Now, what happens with the choroid if we change the zinc homeostasis? And one of the important uh, factors to consider is fenestration uh, of, the, of the endothelium, uh, the choroidal mi microcapillaries. And we can induce that with latrinculin A, which produces this called sift, sift plates of uh, beautiful fenestrase uh, in, the, in the cells. If you add zinc alone, no other things, you still get exactly the same size, but slightly different distribution of fenestration. So zinc seems to be important on the cellular level. So what happens if we feed animals to zinc? These are again just snapshots. One of the things is that when we feed animals for six months on zinc, there is a decrease uh, of Brooks membrane thickness. This is the normal state. When we look at gene expression, the complement system is affected, not the, uh, the, uh, the, the classical pathway rather than the alternative uh, factor H is involved, but basically the whole system can be upregulated. And as you know, we have uh, the ARET study, which shows that zinc is actually useful when you add, uh, when, when you give it to especially uh, neovascular uh, AMD patients. And look what happens. This is a neovascular uh, animal model for AMD. This is the normal clays, lots of vascular uh, uh, extravasation, which of course leaks like crazy and leaks blood into the, into the retina. If we treat these animals with zinc, the number is dramatically decreased. Although, and that's quite significant, although there are no change in the lesion size or the leakiness of these. So zinc actually has a, an effect on many different levels. So I could speak, uh, I, as I can see, I have another 100 slides left. But but I would rather finish here with the message that although we don't know why zinc really is effective in, uh, in the ARET study, uh, all, and we know that the, the, the effect is quite limited, but when you look at the actual cellular or animal work and, and you can do proper experiment, you have a multitude of effects from single molecule to cell, from genes to proteins, and then also on uh, effects like neovascularization. So yes, I think zinc is important uh, uh, in, in our diet. Whether it's good or bad, the jury is still out there, but it's important. And we need to do uh, much better, much more studies to understand how zinc works. And unfortunately, when you apply for grants, uh, then the first answer is, well, from the ARET study, we know that zinc is good, so we don't fund you. 
So when you are reviewing our grants, please remember that there are lots of very interesting things that we need to consider. And I want to finish just with this snapshot. Not that I'm studying it, but um, I know others do. Zinc actually has an effect on carotenoids. And there are several papers which shows the metal and the role of metals in how carotenoids are produced. And I think the interaction between carotenoids and metals in the human body is going to be an exciting and interesting area to, to conquer. And I leave you with this slide because um, we do, uh, all zinc researchers started to realize that there is a problem and we started to team up first in the, in the UK and now we have uh, a European grant funded network uh, building up called Zincnet. Uh, this is the address. Uh, everyone, this is, this is not a, a society, this is not a club, this is, not, uh, this is trying to get everyone who is interested in zinc involved because we need to talk to each other. And in this Zincnet, we have people from plant to soil scientists up to, to neuroscientists and we try to develop better methodologies to detect uh, zinc both in humans and animals and in different tissues. So I'd like to invite anyone who is interested in either contacting me or just going to this website and sign up. And please, please, please support this research as much as you can with your, with your ideas. Thank you. Okay, thanks for some questions in the back. That was a lovely talk. Um, Presumably, uh, zinc is not used up heavily in regular, normal metabolic processes. So what do you know about the sort of recycling and reuse of zinc? Um, I mean, how, so what I'm asking is, how much is lost on a daily basis, and do we need to be replacing it, or is it actually just being recycled? That, that certainly is a very important question, and I wish I would have an answer to that, because I don't. Uh, there is a lot of uh, zinc clear, because we only use a very small proportion uh, from what we take in, uh, so there is a lot of, uh, of information coming out on what you take in and what you pee out, basically. Uh, but, uh, but how the recycling, for example, in the retina is happening is, 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 is a very important question, which I don't have an answer yet. All right. Uh, this is probably more of a comment, but um, you know, zinc intakes are, are, are fairly low, at least in the U.S., I think, and in, in elsewhere around the world. I mean, the RDA is around 12 to 16 milligrams or so. But there's, in the U.S., there's a great enthusiasm for zinc supplements, wound healing for cold prevention, all this kind of stuff. So people are, are really taking high levels, 40 milligrams, et cetera, of zinc. And the problem is uh, zinc and copper are kind of a yin and yang, and, and they're probably causing copper deficiency or marginal copper status by taking high zinc by itself, and I think this is a problem. Uh, that, that's absolutely right, and in fact, there are now studies on cognitive function which, which shows that uh, zinc-induced copper deficiency can cause quite severe uh, issues. At the, at the very back, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, one of my other interests is classic cars, and uh, historically, if you want to prevent your beloved car from going rusty, you would bolt a piece of zinc between metal, between plates of metal, the theory being that the zinc would pump the uh, steel full of electrons. And it did work, or it does work. It prevents rusting, or another name for rusting, of course, is oxidation. So would you think of zinc being a, an antioxidant? Uh, no, I don't think zinc is an antioxidant. Uh, but uh, it plays a very important role in uh, oxidative enzymes. So it's not zinc itself that, that, that's an antioxidant, but it plays a role in the antioxidative process. At least that is my intake in it. So there's a poster I was looking at this morning, all by myself in the poster room. I had my own session. Um, and it was zinc and calcium affected absorption of lutein was the title. And it negatively affected it. And, and how does that play in? I, I, I don't know the Harvest Plus literature. I will. I mean, but, but they, there are some that feel there are positive synergies between zinc and iron and beta carotene. And I don't know whose poster that is, but how do we reconcile these different observations? 
Well, uh, I, I think it's good that they, these observations are coming up, and I do think that that all everything is 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 interconnected in in more than one ways. But I don't think I have an answer to that because we just don't have enough studies to 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 show that. Okay, the final question here uh, in front. Of I, I I have a two-part question. First is if you could comment about zinc and cancer, and number two, if you could comment about uh, zinc and complement factor H and ARMS2 as far as progression of AMD. Uh, would you repeat the second one? Uh, if you could comment about the genetics as far as complement factor H and ARMS2 as far as progression of, of AMD or decrease or increase progression. Uh, so the, the uh, I answered the second one because I've forgotten the first one. About already. cancer, <laughs> zinc and cancer. Yeah, I was just joking. Uh, so I think uh, there is a quite a strongly increasing uh, literature on zinc being an anti-cancer agent. I don't think zinc itself, but the zinc stimulated processes are, are seem to, because of its inhibitory uh, function, as you might remember from that table. So there is a lot of literature that extra zinc is actually very good for cancer regression or prevention of growth. Whether there is enough uh, solid information how that happens, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I, I, I know several uh, pieces of information about different proteins involved in cancer, and especially zinc transporters, for example, how they, how they are involved in cancer cells and, and how change in uh, zinc transporter expression affects cancer, especially breast cancer. Uh, Katy Taylor in, uh, in Cardiff does really beautiful work on that. So the short answer, I think there is a lot of promising information coming out on cancer and, and zinc. But again, how, how we position ourselves, should we supplement people or, or does it need to be a much more directed, uh, cancer directed effect, I, I'm not sure. Well, if it's high dose zinc about causing cancer, can you comment uh, on that? I, I don't have enough information on that one to, to, to make any comments. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, I think if you eat, uh, even if you drink too much water, you can die of it. So, so we need to find the balance of, of, of what's going on. I'm kind of referring to the high dose zinc in the ARADS formula, 80 um, milligrams. I, I think we don't know what, so, so I, I was thinking about just that, but uh, the problem is we don't know what, we know that those, uh, for example, have higher urinary tract infection. Uh, you know something which I didn't, that there is a increased uh, cancer risk uh, in those. But we don't know enough about zinc biology to be actually pinpointed to zinc or something that is driven on the back of the zinc. And in the HT area one uh, CFH study, I think, I think if you, when there is a controversy about something that needs to be studied, that's my view, and um, I'm not taking part. The ARAD people say that there is no zinc uh, genetic polymorphism uh, interaction, while another group in Canada shows that there is uh, on the same data set. So I think it's an interesting uh, uh, issue which needs to be further investigated. The studies are actually pretty much underpowered to make either claims. So, so, final, so final quick, short comment from yeah, uh, quickly John. to conclude on that point, because this, the room is full of various interested business people who are probably afraid to ask the question. What, based on the knowledge you have, what should they do? I know we don't have all the answers, but what would you recommend to, to the people that have an interest in providing supplements? I, if they're in this room. I, I would shy away making any recommendation, but in my opinion, uh, if you look at the literature, it's very important to have proper zinc balance in your body. And I agree with the comments that, uh, comment that, that most of the Western societies are probably marginally zinc deficient, which is extremely uh, difficult to, to show and study. Uh, so if someone asks me what I should do, uh, then I would suggest to eat lots of wonderful vegetables and, and proper food, which is 
if you can't, and in many cases, like in Africa where they don't, they don't eat it, I think normal zinc supplements and normal supplementation with a whatever normal is, uh, level of, uh, of vitamins and, and carotenoids and omega-3s is, is not going to cause a problem. Whether those very high doses which you mentioned would, uh, I think there is some indication clearly that, that we need to be careful. So I think zinc supplementation is, should stay uh, stay in our, our horizon because a lot of people just simply don't have, don't get enough. All the processed food, all the the, the chemicals which we are pumped with uh, through through processed food and 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 anyway, they will interact with uh, with this one. So a long way to go in terms of uh, balanced diet and proper understanding. Can thank I just the speaker again. No, no, no. We we have to move on uh, time wise. So let's speak, thank the speaker thank again. You.